Good afternoon, this is Gary Kavner here on TRSI. I'm here today with my friend and colleague, Michael Dwyer. Today is Sunday, it is the 12th of the 5th. Michael, how have you been since last week? I am well, Gary, and that's the important thing. Leave the past in the past. Today is today, it's a beautiful day. And I just wanted to, to start on one thing, because I got a surprising amount of questions uh, about it, and that is the title of the last show, which I believe was something like... Uh, Helen McEntee, or as some may call her, the Albatross. I had thought this was a well-known reference, Michael, but apparently not a lot of people are still reading the works of Coolridge. The old man, no, the old man, it's, it's the, the, the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Yes, the Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, which is a poem by Coolridge, and uh, it's where the, um, the idea of the Albatross as a weight around the neck comes from. It's actually a uh, well worth reading. I would recommend it. But uh, it, in the book, a sailor shoots and kills an albatross um, on a long sea journey, and then basically is, is cursed with misfortune for having done so. So that is the reference to it. Apparently, it is not, as I said, as well known as I thought it was. Okay, there you go. So a couple of things to go through today. We obviously have a new poll coming out that focused primarily on the European elections. We have the release of new stats by the Garda on hate crimes. NGOs have already started to do a little bit of lobbying on the basis of what came out there. However, we've looked at it. Doesn't stand up terribly strongly, but we'll walk you guys through exactly what's there, what's not there, and how it relates to other crimes, Michael, that the Garda are meant to be dealing with as well. But there's a small thing I wanted to start off on, Michael, a small personal irritant. Yeah. So there was an article uh, on RTE uh, yesterday by Paul Reynolds, the crime correspondent, and it was on the death of Josh Itzeli, um, who was a young man, Michael, who was uh, shot to death recently. The RTE are saying that he was a member of a street gang of young, violent, volatile, reckless, and extremely dangerous drug dealers and criminals it seems like that sentence could have been cut down substantially, but you know, yeah, yeah, would you have? And it basically, the guy was shot recently, and now it looks like there was a uh, it wasn't a targeted killing; it was basically a fuck up on the part of his associates. And it was an interesting article, Michael, because I don't know if you've read this, but it does have a wonderful line about the diversity of criminal gangs in it. It is one of the oddest things I read from RT for a long time. I don't think this was the intention, and it very much depends on how you read it. But you know that when you read a text, you have you can if you change the kind of the, the voice tone in your head, you can completely change the sound, the, the the sense of the message. It did, at from one perspective, feel a little bit like celebrate the diversity. Look, once upon a time, our Dublin drug gangs were just nothing but skaggers, white ordinary skaggers. But now look. We've got great cultural and ethnic diversity in our drug in our Dublin drug gangs. Isn't that great? The, I mean, I'm not I'm pushing it a little bit. But there was a weird sense of, oh look, look how much diverse cultural diversity have even in our drug gangs, and isn't that kind of cool? Which I thought was an odd take. Yes, it, it was. It was a bit of an odd phrasing. I assume what they were trying to do was point out, you know, the ethnic and cultural diversity of Irish crime. And its increasing nature. That's a bit of a spiky topic. Yeah, I suppose it's crime will reflect the society and the culture. And as the society becomes more ethnically and culturally diverse, so will presumably the criminals. Diversity, Michael, after all, is our strength. Diversity is our strength. I'll tell you, I've known a few Nigerian mothers, and I thought if I said so, if there's any of these are Nigerian lads who get involved in gangs, the violence that they're getting on the streets ain't going to be nothing like the violence they'll get at home. Uh, so the article states that this chap's uh, family was originally from the Congo, but he was reared in Dublin, and this is the exact line: organized crime practices diversity. It does not discriminate, nor is it prejudiced when it comes to recruiting criminal gang members. In this country, as in all countries, gang members and dangerous criminals come from any and all nationalities, religions, and ethnic backgrounds. Now, Michael, this may shock you, but while there are criminal gangs that are diverse in the whole, oftentimes those criminal gangs, when you focus on any one of them, will only include people from particular ethnicities or regions or even religion or, you know, family structure sometimes. 
Uh, and do, do you know the the clue to that, Gary? Mm-hmm. Stay with me here because it's, it's it's tricky. If you look, say, for example, at continental Europe or say the United States, when you talk about organized crime, they talk about the Italian, the Sicilian mafia, or the Albanian mafia, or the Georgian mafia, or the Russian mafia. You know, and that's very often because, for example, the Russian mafia is mostly mostly made up of people who are from Russia. The Sicilian mafia was made exclusively of people who could be traced back for generations to Sicily and the Camorra. The use of that national or racial epithet was actually because that's what those gangs were made up of. And again, that's not a a surprise because, as we've observed before, Gary, organized crime is very much based on a trust system Mm -hmm. and and you have to have really good HR. And if you have bad HR and you have a breakdown in trust, then it becomes really hard to work as a business. And you are going to trust people that you know from home far more than you're going to trust people from very, very far away. It also makes it substantially harder to infiltrate those gangs. Exactly. And you know their parents and where their families live, which you know sometimes can be useful. But I, I did like the article notes that some criminals, Michael, may not be Irish, but then has to say, but as in this country, as in all countries... Gang members come from any and all nationality, religions, and ethnic backgrounds. Like a sort of mantra. Like the sin has come into your home, and now it must be prayed away. (laughs) Because if it wasn't there, people might come to conclusions, Michael, that would be inappropriate. Inappropriate. Or appropriate, but uncomfortable. My understanding is what what, what, one of the things that annoyed you about this was not necessarily the description of the gangs, although it's cute, but rather... The description of the, the, shall we say, the hardware. Yeah, so this, normally I overlook these sort of things because Irish people have really little experience with guns. Many Irish people. Some Irish people have a lot of experience with guns. Yeah, with guns and high explosives, but that's not the general knowledge base. No, no. But this is the crime correspondent, Paul Reynolds. So you would assume someone, this is his area, this is what he should know. Yes. Crime uh, and defence and guns all kind of go together. You should know about it. But his, this is the description of the AR-15, which is the weapon they had. He says, the AR-15 is a military weapon, an assault rifle for use in combat zones and wars. The semi-automatic weapon can fire hundreds of rounds a minute, but is not designed for an urban criminal setting. There are at least four different mistakes in those two sentences. That's good, God. So, just on a background here, the AR-15... It stands for Armalite, uh, because they were the original manufacturers before they sold the the patent to Colt, and then the patent basically lapsed, and now it is such a a well-known weapon. It's probably the, I would say it is the most widely held gun in America anyway, because the patent lapsed, and basically you can have AR-style guns or AR-platform guns. So, would the Armalite be kind of the American version of the Kalashnikov? So the way the, the American military works is they have their own... Uh, internal designators on guns so the m16 is not actually an ar-15 it's a it's a similar weapon the platform is the same but it's basically uh, different in in key uh key points at least as it would relate to the ar-15 on the civilian market so the ar-15 is not a military weapon it is not an assault rifle therefore it is not for use in combat zones and wars and it cannot fire hundreds of rounds a minute and i will just go through that It is not an assault rifle for this reason. Uh, A lot of people assume AR means assault rifle. It doesn't. An assault rifle has many characteristics, but the one that's most important is what's called select fire capabilities. So it can go from single to full auto, sometimes, you know, with a burst, um, a three round burst or a setting like that. AR 15s cannot do that. They are fully semi automatic weapons. And so you would never use them in combat. It's not a military weapon. It is very different in important aspects from the M16 or things that would actually be used as military weapons. As a semi-automatic weapon, the way it works is this. Every time you pull the trigger, a single bullet comes out. Now, just from that, you can probably see the problem with the line can fire hundreds of rounds a minute because that would require you to pull the trigger hundreds of times a minute, which, Michael, I don't think you're going to do. And that's ignoring the fact that the most common magazine size for something like this is probably going to be around 30 rounds. You can buy like drum magazines that are called that maybe could fit 100 rounds. 
But for the most part, from what I've seen, those are basically just just the gadgets. They're not useful. They have a great tendency to jam, in which case it doesn't matter if you can theoretically fire 100. But even then, you wouldn't fire uh, more than that. And even if you could, you would not be able to do so with any degree of accuracy. And it would basically be pointing something in a direction and praying to God that the bullets go in broadly that direction. So just on that point, it's just it's just none of that is right. And all of that is the sort of thing that would be only said by someone who has no idea what they're talking about, but wants to say something that sounds right to the general public. Mm. But it indicates just a total lack of knowledge of the area. And then they go on to say, it is not easy to handle firearms, particularly complex military-grade weapons. Military-grade weapons, like, at least in, in terms of rifles, tend to be very easy to use. For, as you might guess, Michael, they need to be used by massive amounts of people. Obviously, there are military weapons which are fantastically complicated, but they don't tend to be rifles. Because, well, you want people to use them. Yeah, but people who are using them will be given training and use it. Oh, they will. But an AR-15 is, even as as you know, rifles go, spectacularly easy to use. Like, a child can use one. Uh, probably with little to no training. Like, they are very, very easy. There's, there's only... To be honest, I think the only thing that might give a problem to someone if they didn't, if they'd never used one before, be the charging handle. And frankly, you figure out how that goes once and then you know how to use it. It's, it's not a difficult weapon to use. It's, it's not difficult at all. <laughs> and then it goes on to say that Gardaí and Defence Forces undergo training that involves academic and practical examinations and that they are tested to the highest standards before being granted permission to carry a gun. I'm not familiar with all of the Gardaí training requirements and how, like, what a, an armed detective versus, you know, the rapid response unit are trained. In general, police training on firearms is not to, and I mean this globally, is not to a particularly high standard. It might You might go to a range, like, twice a year kind of thing. That might be your requirements and then take a written test. Well, um, you'll be given, if not the other, you'll, you, you will have to do safety stuff. How to make, literally how to make a weapon safe and how to stop it being safe. Um, how to load it. Yeah, the thing there again is that like, as someone with some experience with guns, that's not very difficult. Like, you can train most of like most of that, how to disassemble a weapon to the extent you'll need to, how to clean it, how to maintain it. You'll do that in less than a day. The actual, the actual important training with guns is using it repeatedly, going to you know, target shooting ranges, whatever you want to do, and just doing so consistently so that you become very comfortable with that weapon and very accurate with it. So a couple of range days a year are not going to be much of a difference. Now, I don't know. It's possible that the guards have an unusually high standard for weapons training because so few of them actually carry guns. But as a, a general point, globally, police are not very good w- with guns. Well, unless you're talking about like there, there are there will be special or highly specialized groups usually within the police yes. force that will get a higher level of training. Yes, yeah, so something like the Rapid Response Unit or SWAT teams in America, they will generally have a, a much higher uh, standard of um, of usage of guns. Although you start running into problems there, particularly in America, where a lot of the members of those sort of teams are ex-military, and that creates its own problems because the um, should we say, Michael? The threat assessment and response of military trained police can sometimes leave a little bit to be desired when they're dealing with the civilian population. Yeah, rules of engagement are different uh, in a war situation than they would necessarily in a poli- an urban policing situation. But then it goes on to say that um, basically there was a car crash and that the, the gun went off. So there's an important distinction here between what you'd call an, an accidental discharge and a negligent discharge. Accidental discharge is a mechanical failure, basically. Something goes wrong in the gun and it fires. Modern guns, for the most part, are very, very difficult to cause an accidental discharge. Older guns it could happen with. Modern ones, in general, it it doesn't. What you'd instead have is, is what's called a negligent discharge. So the gun didn't go off, someone shot him. Right. Which seems an important point, given that he is now dead. Or a supremely unimportant point, given that he's now dead. But I see, I take what you mean. I mean, yes, there's an argument that, you know, criminal gang members kill each other, no member of the public hurt, do we care? Eh, it's just the reporting of it, Michael. Well, I think that I'm sure to the to the, to the the young man and to the young man's family and friends that it, 
the fact that he's dead is of uh, very great importance indeed. But beyond that, the reporting, I suppose, <clears throat> and I'm going to take your word on the technical stuff because I am not a gunman. I would be able to fire my father's old single uh, bullet 22 uh, for the destruction of rabbits at distance, which I never achieved. That one I would manage because it was a, not a complicated piece of machinery. After that, it's all just mumbo jumbo. I'm assuming what you're saying is true. The problem with this is, this is, we, we, I, I mean, we have talked about it many times. You, I can't remember the name for it. You, there is a name for it, the experience of somebody reading an article in a newspaper where the article is right is talking about something they happen to have a direct personal experience of. They read the article and they realize that it's nonsense. And they think, oh my God, that's just nonsense. And then they read the rest of the newspaper with the same level of trust that they had before they read the article, which is nonsense, because they're reading about something that they don't know anything about. In this case, the vast majority of people are going to read this and just take it as truth. But when you read something and you, and you realize this is nonsense, and not, not nonsense that could have been difficult, Gary, I imagine, in 15 minutes on the internet to discover the, the accuracy of the about. RTE is a large and very well-funded, no matter what they might think, it is a very well-funded media organisation. You want to get stuff right. And if they're not getting just stupid, basic technical stuff like this right, and the people who are writing about it are the experts in the area, they're like it's not the intern that's come in to make the coffee has been forced to write the article, when when one assumes. But this is the, the person who is who is expert in the area, and they're not getting it right on this stuff. It's not an encouraging thought for what they're doing with the rest of the the, the news out there. No, it's that is, that is why I bring it up rather than a desire to be immensely pedantic, although there is obviously always. an element of that to this, always. But it's stuff like he's talking about how uh, the car that these lads was, were in was rammed, and then in the chaos, the AR-15 rifle went off in the car, spraying bullets around. It's not a sentient thing. If it didn't go off, someone mm. fired it. And because it's semi-automatic, someone fired it repeatedly. And just, it, it is that point. It's This is the sort of mistake that no one who knew anything about guns would make. Which is to say that it makes it look like the person overseeing a crime for RTE actually knows nothing about weaponry. Which might, Michael, if you were reporting on criminal you know, gangs be a good thing to know. Well, that one particular point that you made is, I think that's an interesting one. That It sprayed. Now, my understanding of what you said, it, it wouldn't spray under any circumstances. It just, that's not something you can do. As you say, it, 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 it is given a certain kind of a, a kind of a, an animation all, all of its own, but because it, it requires, you know, finger, trigger, finger, trigger, finger, trigger. That's, that's part that's a, that creates a different sense of a story to the thing. It's a bit like you know those descriptions that you very often read that it, this, and this is usually descriptions given by the criminal or by the the assailant when they're talking about a stabbing. They say X happened, then Y happened, then the knife went in. Mm. Not then I stabbed him, and then the knife went in. The knife is it is now the knife which is in control, not the person. In this case, it was the gun, not the person. Actually, just to, to taking your knife point, just to explain how odd this sounds to, to someone who knows a little bit about guns. It's like saying, not that the knife went in, but that the knife, you know, something happened and the knife went in multiple times. Like, that's yes. not really how that works. It just, it's a bit weird. And then, you know, the, the article goes on to this long explanation of the difference between old and new kind of types of gangs, the, the different ways that they would go for it. You sort of go, well, do you actually know anything about this? Because you don't know anything about the rest of it that you're talking about. And there's no clear distinction as to why you would then know something about this. Faithful in small things, be faithful in great. Yeah. Anyway. So, the um, should we go to the poll, Michael, or the hate speech? Well, we'll go to the poll and then circle back to hate speech, since that's another police issue. We don't want to do too much police all in one go. So, new poll from the journal... I know, uh, the journal Ireland thinks it is only a poll of European election voter intentions, but it is quite interesting. So the highlight of this poll is that they went, uh, they asked people, which of the following parties would you give your first preference vote to 
in the European election. And actually, we might mention something about how the preferential vote system works, because I'm getting a, a weird amount of messages about it recently. But uh, we'll go to that later, I suppose. Mm-hmm. So the headline figure is that independence and others is now at 24%, more than any party. Sinn Féin is at 22, Fine Gael at 19, Fianna Fáil at 16, Green Party at 6, Social Democrats at 5, Aim to at 4, Labour at 3, Solidarity, People for Profit, 2. Now, most of the movements here are relatively small, like Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael are both down 1, Social Democrats down 1, Aim to down 1, mm-hmm. uh, People for Profit down 1, and Sinn Féin down 1. Independents and others are up 7% in a month. Nine, nine, nine percent in a month. Is it? Yeah. No, Plus I think they're on seventeen last month, and they're on twenty-four now. Right. On the Governor Riley gives it as plus nine, but you maybe you're right. I don't know. Twenty-four minus seventeen is yeah, that's that's seven. Yeah, you know, pretty sure. <laughs> twenty-four minus seventeen is seven. I'm I'm willing I'm willing to go with that. I will accept that. <laughs> Unless my math is wrong or the journal have given the wrong figures. Gavin O'Reilly got it wrong. Yeah. So if you are a month out from by the European and local elections, both of which are important for different reasons, independence and others going up 7% in a month is kind of a terrifying move if that is a trend. That's the question. I mean, there was... A- when I was a child, there used to be a thing on Saturday night on, uh, on English television, which, would, which was called a variety show. And a variety show would have all sorts of like, like dancers and comedians. And, and one of the things that you occasionally get, you used to see it in circuses as well, was a guy who would come out and on top of these thin sort of vibrating poles, he would spin plates. And he would have maybe five, six, seven, eight, nine different plates all spinning at the same time. And it was, it was great entertainment. Well, I was reminded a little bit because the spinning, Gary, that was going on directly after this poll came up was really quite impressive. I mean, the actual spinning wasn't impressive, but the the willingness, the desire and the quantity of the spinning. So many people coming up with, you know, that voice of tired. Listen, I know something about this. You're kind of missing the point. Yeah, it looks like something, but it's not anything really. And the point they were that people were making was that if you actually compare these figures with the actual results of the 2019 election, there's no great seismic change because independents and others got 24% of the vote in the last... Now, I actually would say that that there's a certain amount of accounting going on to get to the figure of 24 in the last election. And the other thing is, first, Fine Gael got 29% in the Euros last time out. They're on 19 in this, which constitutes more than a third of a, a, a drop of a third of your vote. I think... That 29 to 19% is a seismic change. Anyway, but the big question, moving beyond that petty fogging detail, the big question is, where 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 are we, shall we say, with the tide? Mm. Is this a high tide moment? Is the, Or is there momentum? Will the... Will, <laughs> like, I am struggling to imagine two things. I'm struggling to imagine that there's going to be a lot of a good news story cycle for the government in the next few weeks, Gary, that is going to turn the tide for Fine Gael or for Fianna Fáil. Right now, as the sun is shining, and maybe, you know, it's more pleasant to be out in the sunshine in along the lovely Canal Bank walks or in the parks of Donnybrook or in the Phoenix Park, you know, I think we're going to see more and more tents coming and going and coming and going. And the general sense that we're now not being run by a government, but we're being directed in a French farce is getting very strong. And I think that when you get voters looking at the government and they're no longer thinking they're a, they're a shower of pricks, but they're a shower of gobshites who are incompetent. <laughs> that's a real big problem. And I think so. That's one problem. The other problem is uh, when, how they organize their communication strategy. Now, I don't know what you think. I am not filled with confidence based on our previous experience in, say, the referendums and other things, 
that the, the Fine Gael and Fine Fáil have a communication strategy capacity on board to turn the tide of the narrative that has now got out. So who knows? This may be a high point for the independents. But I could see that if they get 25, 26, 27, once they, if they get up 27, 28%, then, yes, it becomes a kind of a seismic moment. So I think it was interesting for Fine Gael, because you see Harris actually move on this, taking the tents out, but sending them elsewhere. Now, when we looked into that, a large amount of that seemed to be basically shuffling around other people so you could put these guys in and then they'll be shuffled around. So, you, so it's, it's largely an image thing or a PR thing. But that sort of thing is important because it gives voters a sense that you're doing something. But as you said, the problem is then it immediately descends into this sort of farce where it's Harris looking at the crowd of children while they frantically point at the tents that are coming back behind him. (laughs) Sorry. And that was the, the problem. Other tents begin to come up. We saw the Grand Canal in a couple of days. There were a hundred tents there. Um, from, from sending Ben Scallon down. But then you have O'Gorman coming out. And admitting that the tents being provided to the to the asylum seekers are being paid for by the government because they're supporting NGOs who are giving these tents out because people had rightfully noticed, Michael, that all of these tents are the same, which kind yeah. of indicates that someone is buying them in bulk. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So now you have, OK, we're doing something, but now it looks like you're being run around. And then it turns out that you, you know, you're paying for it. So the public is paying for tents, paying for the tents to be cleared, and then paying for the tents to be destroyed, which is a just a wonderful, perfect circle of life of Irish governance. The government pays the NGOs, the NGOs do something that they want to do, and then the government has to fix the problem and pay for that as well. I think you observed, was, I don't know, it was last week or a couple of weeks ago, Gary, that it is at least um, a positive for people in the, uh, in the camping trade. At a time which is off peak, you know, where normally you wouldn't be doing a lot of business. This this is actually a wonderful example of you know the the argument, Michael, about the nature of of real economic activity. Like mm-hmm. if you just destroy something and then have it made over and over again, is that real economic activity? Yeah. We have done that, but with tents. This is yeah. This is the Irish government's version of Bastiat's broken window fallacy. That mm. this, but now it's Bastiat's tent. <laughs> Bastiat's Asylum Shanty Town. <laughs> oh, it, 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 it's a wonderful time to be alive. <laughs> Actually, uh, on the poll, um, yeah. I saw something during the week, which when you see something where it's just, it's well executed and it's highly political and you just look and you're like, ah, that's some politics Go on. on the European election. Did you see who uh, Michael McNamara has declared as his uh, substitute. So for those who don't know, when you run for the European um, Parliament, you declare a substitute. And then if for any reason you can't serve, either because you you leave to run in national elections or you become too ill to serve, in most cases, not all, um, your deputy would take over. Did you see who his deputy is? I did not. Marin McGrath. Remind me. Matty McGrath's daughter. Oh, yes. Oh, oh. Oh, very good. Yeah. Oh. So, for so for those who don't realize why this is what is so nice, McNamara is very strong in his area, but he and obviously his constituency is in the constituency he's running in. But the problem with the Europeans is that you're not just running in your own constituency; you're running in that entire region, and you don't have people in the rest of the region. So, if you could bring on an immensely popular local TD who wants to advance the political career of his daughter um, by giving him something that you may not actually need to do anything with because you may just stay in that position yourself, you would massively increase your reach throughout the European constituency at basically no cost to yourself. And Matty very much wants his daughter to succeed in politics. So this is, uh, this, as I said, this is some real politics, Michael. Oh, that was that's that's yeah that's that's good. The fact I would kind of hope that Marion ends up going to Europe rather than than Michael, it's not for only because I think that he is one of the strongest performers in the doll. I think he's an extremely competent person. I think that with absent any other possible 
any other positives, I think he's probably the strongest candidate for the European elections as it stands. Um, if you were just going to vote people on the basis of competency and capacity, uh, I think you'd be worth him. But he's well got in Cork and uh, in the rest of Limerick. I imagine, I don't know, but I imagine from the from the, the rural independence, he would have a decent relationship with the Healy Rays. I mean, if he could harness to some extent those relationships, he should be nailed on. No, it's an election. Not, nobody is ever nailed on. But I think that the people of Ireland South would be very... I, I, I'm not going to tell people how to vote, but I can tell you, he's. I, I have a lot of time for him. And I think anybody who wants to know why, well, you should follow. Have a look at the various clips of him talking in the doll and compare the quality of his interventions with the quality of virtually everybody else. But also look at that famous five minutes uh, with McEntee. Now, and this time, don't concentrate on McEntee and that cringe fest. Cause, and, and to be honest, you'll be better and happier person if you don't listen to hell on that because it's not pleasant. But listen to him. Observe him and observe the way he forms, formulates his questioning and how he follows it. Very impressive piece of parliamentary work. Yeah. McNamara has an interesting problem in Irish politics as he runs for Europe in that he is at the actual business of cross-examination, of being in opposition, of what would in most countries, Michael, be considered the work of a national politician. He is one of the best in the doll, possibly the best in the doll on certain issues. So him going to Europe is actually legitimately a loss. Just yeah. on a, a pure competency basis. Now, I have no idea how he is with the things that Irish politicians actually concern themselves with, which is local work. I assume pretty solid on that, both because he's remained elected for so long and because of the reason he left Labour. He would legitimately be a loss in Europe, but he would also be well suited to Europe. He is He's very interested in international affairs. He's well spoken. He's competent. He would be a good showing for us over there as well. Um, it'd be interesting to see who he sits with, what his policies are actually going to be. But on a pure competency basis, he's one of the few Irish politicians that I would think of as just extremely competent at their brief. Yeah, it just occurs to me now, thinking about that, and maybe it's a commentary on you know, their own sense of politics. I was thinking, why is your, I was thinking about the fact that I think that McNamara is one of the most effective doll performers, and I was just in my head thinking, who else did I? Think? And do you know another person that I, not that I would have necessarily personally been a great fan of, but I thought was regularly one of the best people in the doll, particularly for his his understanding of what the right question was. You know, when the government was in trouble, mm. he knew the question. He was really well briefed and well prepared. Was uh, Alan Kelly. Also, Alan Kelly, yes. Also a Labour TD, as Michael McNamara was a Labour man. And now McNamara out of the party and uh, Alan Kelly sacked from the leadership for no apparent reason except to, except to give the job to Ivana Bacic. And we see Labour where they are, where I was talking to somebody uh, recently uh, in the polling business uh, who was strongly of the opinion, he has been for a while, and he said other colleagues in the business are similarly convinced. That Labour is failing, fares, facing down the barrel of a single TD being report, returned in the next general election. And you think they had someone like McNamara and Kelly, really competent performers at all. And yes, this is where they are. Kelly, Kelly gone and McNamara out the door. It's not, it's not a great look for your, for your HR department. I, I know when Kelly was, or when, before Kelly became leader, we had a discussion and I was saying that I thought Kelly was really their only chance of turning it around. Um, that just because of the nature of the rest of them, he was the only game in town and that I thought he had a good chance of doing that. And then when it came to the end of his leadership, I think we had to have a, well, maybe we were wrong. Maybe he wasn't the right person. Uh, but anyway, he doesn't seem to have moved them up in the polls. But I do think it is interesting that once he goes and Ivana comes in, you saw what you didn't see under Kelly, which was rapid disintegration. So it may be that Kelly was the right man for them, but given the current moment, this is you know, that was about as well as they were doing. He was holding the thing together. And also he was getting them some positive positive news because his, uh, the stuff he particularly did, the stuff with injustice, the stuff he mm -hmm. was doing on the guards, he was very strong on that. And yeah, he got excellent. them a lot of positive news. Yeah, He's become much quieter since he lost the leadership. Um, and I wonder how much of that is just a sense of, you know, 
I'm done here. Like, yeah. Well, why bother? Why bother? Yeah. Uh, because, yeah, as you said, the stuff he was getting, particularly from Justice, was excellent. He was all over it. He was, you know, he was dealing some damage. And then afterwards, he just, just disappeared. He was doing political damage. He was also, I would say, doing the state service mm. in a very old fashioned kind of a, uh, a notion there. But I think he actually did the state service and the stuff he was doing in justice. But there you go. Yeah, it's uh, the polls are. Uh, you have to say, you, you have to think, Gary, that the, the, the three headline numbers leave for the, the parties must be causing a certain amount of anxiety. It, obviously, nobody will admit that. But Sinn Féin on 22 is not suggestive that Sinn Féin are going to be taking lots of second seats, you know, either in the South or in the West or, or in Dublin. Whereas a little while ago, there might have been a suspicion that they could take possibly a second seat in Dublin. Uh, Fine Gael down, down 20, 10 points uh, is very much in a, a party which is looking down. The, there no way are they taking a seat, two seats in the uh, what is Midlands West? There's no. They're going to struggle maybe to take a seat in one of the other two. I mean, the only thing I would say here is that the poll specifically asked, you know, which of the following parties would you get your first preference vote in the European elections? And I'm always a bit wary of that wording because in Ireland, you know, we don't have a list system. Yeah, there. True, true, true. A lot of this, I think, will depend on the candidate. Like, I think people have a tendency to go, oh, yeah, whatever. I go to these guys. But then go, oh, yeah, he's running. He's a good shot. Yeah. And maybe not the first preference, but they'll get, you know, the second or third. And then, you know, they're in the running. I think the, as you said, Michael, the interesting thing is, where is this poll in relation to the trend? Is this the peak of it? And independents and others are going to fall or remain steady at 24? Or was this poll taken during a period of increase, but not at the end? And independents and others are going up to, you know, 26, even 30. Like, what kind of movement are we seeing here? Because if that is just a trend that is going to continue on the same um, on the same kind of basis, independence would be at about 30% before the actual election, which would be a bloodbath. Now, particularly for the Europeans, but if these poll results are replicated in the locals, and we don't know if they are, uh, they didn't ask, it's hard to judge these things, but you would expect there would be some reflection in the locals as well. But then again, that is also very personal. It could be. The locals and the Europeans don't necessarily mirror themselves. I mm. think the 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 Europeans, in a sense, are, are more like, tend to behave a little bit more like unimportant referendums in that they're used for people to vent a little bit more. Uh, so that if there is a, a, a level of dissatisfaction or if there's a, a level of alienation in the wider voting population, that will be amplified in, in an election uh, in the Europeans. Now, I've been talking to a couple of people from the from the, the party system and they're, yeah, there's, yeah, there will be change, but there's always a churn. There's around a, a third of the seats will go, will, will turn over in any one local election but they don't expect that there's good because that in a local election this is the theory this that in the local election there's far more you vote for the candidate you don't vote for the party that there's a sense of personal loyalty and i get that and i think there's a there's truth to that i think that there is something a little bit different this time first of all if you imagine the Fianna Fáil vote or the Fine Gael vote but especially the Fianna Fáil vote as being a, a jar with a very a very tight lid on it. Once upon a time, you know, there's no way you're getting that vote out. Just not. That's the Fianna Fáil vote. I think over the last twenty years, you've seen that the lid and that that get looser and looser. And this time round, for the first time, really, certainly in my lifetime, if you wanted to vote for, say, a socially a more socially conservative type of candidate who wasn't a bit mad. You can. For the first time, there's going to be a, a wide offering across the country of independents who look and sound far more like rural or small town Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil did 20 years ago than Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael do now. And I think that, that the old traditional party loyalties and even the idea of the personal loyalty thing 
has eroded as part of the culture. I mean, we, we don't have the same sense that we have duties to people in the way that we we once would have, that we think of ourselves and our, our vote as something that is far more as we wish to dispose of it. So the offering is there. And I think the other thing that they don't get is that the reason the offering, is, it's a kind of a, it's a chicken and egg, Gary. The, it's not, the the, the offering of the, the, the candidate selection has appeared not simply because the votes are now there and there for the people to come out, but rather it's part of the same process. Many of these people who are presenting themselves are people who historically would have been, if they were involved in politics, either Fine Fáil or Fine Gael or rural labour. The fact that they're there is is not just, is a symptom also of the way that the, the politics have changed. So if these votes are anything like it, I think you could see, I think people could be very surprised in certain areas. It'll, a lot of it will depend on the candidates, particularly in local elections, where people actually know you, literally, not just don't know you in the sense that they've seen you on television or heard you on the radio, but these are people that actually know you. And if the the quality of the candidates is there, the fact that there there's an offering, I think there could be a bigger churn. There was actually, um, and it relates to Sinn Féin, there was another act of, of wonderful politics that happened yeah. last week on Friday, but we didn't touch on it. And that was the leak from... Um, Davy, did you see this? No. So, uh, uh, Davy, the, the stockbrokers, had a oh, meeting yeah, with Pierce Doherty. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, Davy. Don't I call him Davy? Anyway, it's a good know. name for them. They should consider it. Uh, he had a, a sit down with them. They published it, and the Independent obviously got hold of it. But it made two interesting things, which are true. But I don't think are helpful for Sinn Féin's folks. One is that uh, Pierce Doherty said that the economic approach was going to be more like Tony Blair's new Labour than Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party, which is the sort of thing you say to stockbrokers. But given your voter base, comparing yourself to Tony Blair is perhaps not what they would like. Mm. But he also said that Sinn Féin would be able to tame the far right movement that's emerged due to record levels of immigration into the country. Now... You talk to most people aware of this. There is a general acceptance that Sinn Féin is why we haven't seen more sort of natalist, anti-immigration, nationalist uh, political groupings in this country. That the people who would traditionally have started or empowered something like that went into Sinn Féin and that Sinn Féin basically stopped that movement from emerging. Sorry, I I, I saw somebody from that, shall we say, part of the world, criticising somebody on, on online and describing them as nothing but an ethno-nationalist. And I, I, one couldn't help but reflect the fact that, well, isn't ethno-nationalism sort of the historic genetic code of Sinn Féin? Isn't that precisely yes. what it is? <laughs> that, that is the problem. It's, it's ethno-nationalism, but a nice kind of ethno-nationalism as opposed to the bad kind that we've stopped from happening. With a dash of marks. Again... The problem with saying something like that um, is that well, it's true. Yeah, absolutely. Or it appears to be true, or it's at least a plausible argument. Yeah. But there is a segment of Sinn Féin voters and Sinn Féin activists and Sinn Féin people that have broken away from Sinn Féin because they see Sinn Féin not as a counter to a far right movement, but as basically um, having betrayed what Sinn Féin said it was. And... This kind of gives those people ammunition because they can go to other people and say, well, it's not just us saying it, it's Pierce Doherty saying it. And when he says it, what he actually means is that, you know, anyone who's opposed to whatever, be it globalism or the NGOs or whatever you're having yourself, it just seems to give those people ammunition. And I don't know why you would say it a month before an election. Well, you would say it, Gary, because you'd assumed it wasn't going to get in the papers. Yes, but that's kind of a silly thing. But why, why I said it, it's, it's a good example of politics is we don't know how the independent got this. Maybe Davo just, or maybe Davy just made it public. Um, or maybe they just sent it to their general investors and obviously from there it was going to leak. But if it was a deliberate leak, it's a leak that very much understands Sinn Fein and its voter bases in a way that most of the pushback against Sinn Fein has not. Mm-hmm. Like Finnefall and Finnegal's pushback against Sinn Fein has been utterly ineffective. There were already people who agreed with some of their positions that Sinn Féin was unfit for government, things like that. But no one else was ever convinced by those arguments. 
because the people voting for Sinn Féin didn't care about those arguments. Whereas something like this is actually potentially damaging in a kind of low-level way where it'll keep coming up and people will say it quietly and, you know, you'll lose a voter here, an activist there, and over time it could actually just kind of worm its way in. So, yeah, I think it's if it was a deliberate leak, it was one done with a very solid understanding of the politics of this. I think it shows an understanding, perhaps reflective of younger people, that 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 is that the people doing the leaking may have been younger people in that that it just it understands the zeitgeist of Irish politics. What Fine Fáil and Fine Gael had, I don't know if they're still doing it quite so much, but for a long time, it it displayed uh, the mentality of people who had entered politics in the 1980s, that they thought that all you had to do was lick Sinn Féin to the IRA and go IRA, IRA, horrible, horrible, bad, bad terrorism. And I don't want to diminish the things that the IRA did, but that would, you know, you you understand the shorthand, that this was this the sense that all you had to do was remind them that, that there was this con- intimate connection between Sinn Féin and the IRA, that Sinn Féin was just the political uh, face of the IRA. And that would be enough. What they didn't seem to understand was that post Good Friday, there were two sets of people. One set of people said, OK, yeah, we know that, but we think that the time has come to move on. We have to draw a line underneath that. We can't spend our life ups- constantly obsessing about that. In a sense, like we we should have had like one of those truth and reconciliation processes that they had in South Africa, although we did to a kind of way. But for many, many young people they know of that but it's literally history and they they've they've priced that in to their attitude to Sinn Féin they know it they're not saying they're happy about it or that they think it was a good thing but they've priced it in and it doesn't matter how many times you tell them all you sound like to them is somebody you sound like their history teacher talking about the civil rights movement in the 60s they go yes yes sir yes sir yes sir we know that's that's great grand but come on can we move on it was always an argument that galled me, not because of the, of the historical nature of it, but because when you look at the Troubles and you look at how things end and Sinn Féin's involvement in that, the very clear line that was pushed is stop the violence, become a part of the normal political process. And that's what happens. And to then turn around and say these people are not fit to be included in the democratic process because of their history, yeah. when you yourself advocated that they should become involved in the democratic process, always made me just think slightly less of Fine Fáil or Fine Gael. I mean, there are issues, absolutely, with Sinn Féin and criminality. And some of those continued, shall we say, after the um, the end of the Troubles. And there were some instances involving party members that you could call to. But it, that doesn't tend to be where the other parties call to. They tend to call back to the Troubles and the violence there. Yeah, yeah, and it never. Uh, it seemed like a bait and switch. Like, give us what we want, and you can do this. And now that we've got what we want, we just don't like you very much. Well, they, and that's part of it. They don't, and they don't like them very much. They also don't like the fact. I mean, particularly for Fianna Fáil, that while Sinn Féin have done a lot of stuff right from the perspective of how you organise a popular political movement and how you translate that popularity on the ground into seats in, in parliaments. They have just been good at that. I've said before that it's a mixture of capacity and luck. And to, to say you're lucky doesn't diminish it because when you're given luck, the test of the person is to the extent that you exploit the luck that you've been given. Now, the luck that mm. they were given was that Fianna Fáil made a bollocks of the... And let's face it, I'm a big fan of Bertie Ahern, but Bertie missed big things. That government, after, say, 2000, that 2002, 2007, there were opportunities. We were always going to have a landing, Gary, in the Celtic Tiger, but there were opportunities to soften the nature of that landing, which were refused. And, you know, it, it's not the, the dogs in the street who had the numbers could knew the degree to which the exchequer had become dependent, etc., on construction. We, we don't need to really get that, but one of the reasons that Sinn Féin, Sinn Féin is so unpopular with certain elements of Sinn Féin is because they've, they've stolen their voters. And young, urban, working-class voters that became extremely disillusioned with Fine Gael, Fine Fáil after that, and that have migrated. So, of course, they, they don't like them. They don't like them because of the Northern connection. They don't, they don't like them for all sorts of reasons. 
But you're absolutely right in the money when you talk about this bait and switch because Sinn Féin has to, has to transition into a normal party. It has to become normalised in the way it does politics and that for it to fit in and for the governance of this country to go on. And there seems to be a, almost a reluctance, and I can understand it politically, but it's deeply dishonest, to allow that normalisation to complete itself because if you keep insisting on dragging it and dragging it back and dragging it back and dragging it back to questions and to issues which will which will stop that normalization happening. But it's politics, so let's let's not weep tears over the lack of ethics and morality too much because then we'll just sound silly. So moving on from the poll, Michael, and we'll touch on this briefly, the hate crime data that uh, came out during the week, it's already led NGOs to say that we urgently need the hate crime bill because of this data, there's been much talk about it, much commentary on it. Sorry, Gary, before we go on, can I ask you just to do something? Yeah. And I'm not, this is a genuine hit. There are a lot of, a lot of headlines, right, about this. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, increase in hate crimes and all that. Could you, just for the sake of my own clarity, are we talking about, or can we draw a distinction between what is one thing and what is another thing? Mm-hmm. There, there are hate crimes, or are there hate crimes? And then there are what are called non-crime hate incidents or something like that. So could could you just explain what is one, what is the other, and what are these figures actually recording? So here is here's what they say. Where someone calls into them, basically you, you can uh, submit online that you've been, that you've witnessed, not even been the victim of, but have witnessed a hate crime or, or hate related incident. And um, what it is, is you basically call up the guards and say that you have seen something or experienced something where you perceive that the perpetrator's hostility, and this is their, their definition, hostility or prejudice against any person, community or institution is on the grounds of the victim's age, disability, race, color, nationality, nationality even. Nationality, Jesus Christ, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, or gender. So that is what is happening here. No, sorry, I want to just interrupt there, and because it says if the victim or any other person perceives, right? Mm-hmm. The guard, is, the guard, always add any other person may include a witness, a family member, a relative, mm-hmm. a friend, a member of the guard personnel. A person working with a non-governmental or civil society organization who has mm-hmm. knowledge of the victim, alleged crime or scenario. They may mm-hmm. also be a support worker or professional with particular knowledge of the victim, the alleged crime or the scenario. No corroborating evidence is required in order to make a report. So where you make a report, which again, Michael, is entirely perception based and is, is just a report. There's no investigation. The split is that a hate crime is where you say that you perceived something to be motivated by hostility or prejudice on the protected characteristics, and it involved something that could be reasonably described as a criminal offence, like an assault or harassment or something of that nature. And a hate-related instance, non-crime, is where you call up the guards and say that you perceived something that you uh, think was uh, motivated by hostility or prejudice on those grounds, but where there's no clear criminal element to it. That's clear. Yeah. And they say they do that because they want evidence of the prevalence of issues within communities. Yeah. Now, based on the definitions alone, Michael, I think it's pretty clear what the problem is here. This is entirely perception-based. It is a reporting system that happens online. It differs from other perception-based crimes. So there are, there are perception-based crimes. So, for instance, if someone threatens to kill you, there's an element of perception there, obviously. Yes. If you don't think that they threat that you know, it was a legitimate threat, you're probably not going to report it as a crime. That obviously plays into it. But in that case, it's, you know, it's generally pretty clear if someone is threatening to kill you. So there's an element of perception, but there's also an element of reality. That's also, that's, that can be an important component of, of a crime or a defence, because you have the right to employ... A reasonable amount, a reasonable force to defend yourself, and that will be that maybe based on the your the perception you have of the threat that you are experiencing. So the greater the your your perception of the the, the threat or the, the the nature of your perception, then 
that will change your your reaction and the plausible defense that you can use for the amount of force that you use. So that is an important point. This is this is actually a point which I've run across occasionally because occasionally people will you know Michael will say things to me with a particular intent, and occasionally people have said that those things sound like death threats or you know threats of harm. And what I will generally say is it you know. It's something like Paul Murphy having you know, Paul Murphy rest in peace spray painted on his wall. That's not a threat to kill someone. That's a wish that someone dies. It's a prayer. Yeah. So it's not, I wouldn't say that that's a threat. In the same way comments made towards me, I oftentimes say, well, that's not a threat. They're wishing ill on me, but they're not threatening to do it. But that is you know, obviously an element of perception there. Other people might say, no, that's it should be classed a threat. But the person could say basically make that defense. So there is an element of reality and a defensibility that is not here in this because these are logged based entirely on perception and with no requirement to actually investigate and understand what happened. Yeah. So if someone says, I perceived it to be this and a normal person would say, that's because you are a moron, the guards will instead say, excellent, one more for the records. Like that's... That's the problem here. And then, of course, there's a question of should the guards be collecting data on things they themselves admit are not crimes? Which I know, <laughs> the other way they say there's non-crime incidents, but the hate crime part is also, just to stand over this, has not in any way been verified to be a crime. Yeah. So here's the other thing. So they're, they're saying that there was a 12% increase, and that's the way it's being reported is 12% increase in the number of hate crimes. Now, putting aside the, the definitional issues that show that saying that there have been hate crimes actually doesn't show anything. And also, there's no way to know if the rate of this is going up or if more people are becoming aware that the Garda offers this service. Yeah. So the actual increase in, in purely hate crimes, setting aside hate-related non-crime instances, is about 7%. So just as a, a small little note there, when you see a, a, a report that says, you know, 12% increase in hate crimes, they actually haven't even read the figures correctly. So you're saying it's a 7% increase? Purely on hate crimes. So what some people have done is taken the the guards saying there's a 12% increase in the number of hate crimes and hate-related non-crime incidents and just removed the last part of it. So this is a combination... This They're they are combining both figures. Hate crimes and, hate, and hate-related non-crime... Sorry, what's the phrase? Hate hate non-crime incidents? What's, what's the Hate-related non-crime incident. Hate-related... No, I mean, we, we're tired kind of asking the question. What? Why are guards spending their time recording things that are not crimes? But hey-ho. But I would also note that when you, you look at this and you look at the total numbers reported, so there were 548 hate crimes in uh, 2023. And, you know, we've talked through all of the issues with that. But even if that were absolutely correct, Michael, and there were that many hate crimes, I've got to say, like, we'd be doing pretty good. Do you know how many sexual offences there were in 2023? Not a clue. Over 3,000. There were more rapes in this country last year than hate crimes. There were nearly a 1,000 rapes, I think 900 and just over 900, actually, against 548 hate crimes. Hate crimes are rarer than rape, which is a relatively rare crime on you know its actual base. I mean, you look at a, you could do this with nearly any area. Now, I'm not suggesting that the prevalence of a crime indicates the severity of the crime. Oftentimes, more severe crimes are rarer. Sure, but even where we we have all of these issues, where it's a purely perception based thing, there's nothing stopping someone from calling up. And saying, I saw this and I perceived it in a certain way when a reasonable person wouldn't. And inflating the the numbers. And particularly, Michael, if you are perhaps an NGO or an activist who has an interest in those numbers going up and knows there's not a lot of verification on the back end here, what is stopping you doing this? Now, I will point out that the guard system is better than those run by most of the NGOs because you need to give them contact information, which means they can always chase it up with you. I don't know to the extent that they do, but most of the NGOs collect this kind of information and don't require you to leave any of your details so they can't verify it. So it is, it it is better on that basis. But you're dealing, you know, there are, you know, 10 times more assaults in the country. Even if these numbers are accurate for a country of several million people, Michael, it actually seems like a very minor problem. Okay. I want to just check. Two things I want to clarify. First of all, when we talk about hate crimes, we're talking about a crime where 
part of the constitutive or part of, part of the motive for the crime is perceived to have been uh, hatred or prejudice against one of the nine protected categories, right? So it's part mm-hmm. of the motivation. So it's not that the crime is hate, but rather there is, there is an old-fashioned crime committed and part of the motivation, the, the hatred attaches to that. Now, while the crime has to be proven, right? So if it's burglary or assault or whatever, that has to be proven. The hate element of it is, Gerard Casey says, for the purposes of this kind of legislation, perception is constitutive, not recognitive. So you don't have to prove, for this to be recorded as a hate crime, It does. you don't have to prove that it was a hate crime. You have to prove that it was a crime and then there has to be a perception of hate. Is that correct? That, that is correct. And that's actually, you and I talked about this extensively when we were discussing some of the drafts of the, the hate speech bill. Yes. Because some of those did actually have exactly the same test in it. And we had made the point that it wouldn't be that, you know, an unreasonable person could say this and then you would be falsely convicted. It would be as the law is written, you would be correctly convicted. Yes. Because they don't need to, to do anything. They just need to say, I thought this. So, yeah, it, it is it is entirely perception based. No. Um, and I'm sure in this there are going to be people who were legitimately hurt or assaulted or verbally abused. And obviously that should not happen. But there's how much of that is this and how much of that is low level or you know, the sort of stuff that a reasonable person might go, well, that's not really it's not really prejudicial, is it? And that's ignoring any of the other issues, as I said. I want to just sort of, uh, sorry, I, I want to move on to a more important point. But so, for example, in this case, got, even if you could actually, pre- I mean, and this is not just perception, which is generated, but maybe. So imagine one is walking along the street at night in Dublin. And I don't know if you're aware, but I don't know if it's still going on. I don't think it is. It's to the same extent. There was a, a for a couple of years there, there was a, a game that was being played in Dublin where people would come up behind somebody walking on the street and knock them down in certain way that they would do fairly serious damage to themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, a mate of mine was walking down Camden Street and he was knocked over and they broke his cheekbones and his nose and he had teeth knocked out and he was in his, his sinus, the sinus uh, orbital uh, bone in, around the eye was broken. He was in a lot of pain. Very nasty. And it was a purely random thing. It was a kind of a game that had become a thing. So I, say I'm walking down Capel Street. I've come out in the Neelands and somebody comes up behind me and does this. And because they've seen me coming out in the Neelands, they've seen me coming out of Panty, they... As they go by, they slap me in the back of the head or push me over and and attach some kind of an anti-gay slur. That would now constitute a hate crime. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, if they push me over and and observe that I was old, no, not old, because old would be covered, but because I I was short and fat, that wouldn't be a hate crime. No, no. Because it's not one of the protected characteristics. Okay. So that, that would constitute hate crime. Now, if your business is hate, right? So, you know, the other saying, water is my business and my and business is good. So if your business is hate, what's to stop a, what's the phrase, a, a non-governmental or civic organization getting into the business of hate crime and juicing the figures? Uh, nothing. Like, like, I mean, I understand with the guards that at the top level, this is my sense of talking to Gardaí, that at the top level, they have the horn for this. They're mad for this. They think this is all this culture war stuff at the top end of the of the guardy for whatever reason. They're mad for it and they think it's great. If you go to actual, actual guards, they hate it. And it's not they hate it necessarily because they're some kind of old-fashioned troglodyte type people who don't care about this, but rather they're undermanned, under-resourced, and they really resent the fact that they're spending time on this, that they should actually be spending time on what they consider to be real crimes, real victims. And they, a guard very recently said to me that we're going to be, we, we have always spent time with victims, trying to talk to them, trying to give them a sense that we're trying to do something, that we're doing something, that they are protected, that people care, etc. And you've taken away our time and we're going to take away that capacity to do something that nobody wants to do. And there, there's a lot of resentment about that, that they're not going to be allowed to do what they feel is their real job 
in this for a virtual signaling. There are several people I know in the guards, and I do, I do love the idea of them having to go to someone and go, "No, sir, when he broke your arm, do you feel he did it with hate in his heart?" <laughs> Just because I know them, and that will kill them inside. But yeah, it, I have two issues with this. One, I think it's it's anti democratic, as the EBI said in its submission on the hate speech bill, or as I said. You know, the other saying is that you're the only things that you're actually equal in front of are the law and God. And if we do this, you're no longer going to be equal in front of the law. If an assault is serious and is made against someone, it shouldn't matter why that assault happened beyond the normal grounds on, on which it might it might matter. There is obviously an intent element of this, but not like this. This is is, is unnecessary. I also think it will, if anything harm, shall we say, racial relationships, Michael. I don't think the government deciding in this highly contentious issue, oh, by the way, we're going to start arresting people for it if you do the wrong thing. Uh, I, I'm not sure that's particularly helpful. There is one thing I actually just wanted to mention on the stats, because they give a breakdown of the um, of the types of crime that they're saying happened here. And it's interesting because they give the... I think, what, the seven highest, uh, most common types of crime? And that only adds up to 362. So you've nearly another 200 criminal instances involving hate, which are not public order offences, minor assaults, criminal damage, assault causing harm, uh, incitement to hatred, criminal damage, or menacing phone calls. So we're quite interested, you know, what it actually falls under. Also, I would point out that the, the majority of these um, crimes are public order offences, not assaults, not even harassment or incitement to hatred. In fact, there's only 23 instances where the criminal type class is classified as um, incitement to hatred, and only 38 where it's an assault causing harm. 38 in total. Well, that's of course. I mean, as the guards have said, they, they, these numbers are what they are, but they would be. They're very keen that people report more and more of them, so we can know what the real nature of the... Uh... Yeah, I mean, the, the upper levels of the guards, particularly those involved in the HR element, seem very interested in not just this sort of stuff, but a whole host of weird stuff um, involving gender and sensitivity and things of that nature that I'm not sure how well that gels with the culture of the Irish guards. Uh, I don't think it gels at all. And I think that the recent uh, poll on... Do you have confidence in the commissioner or not? The results of that poll, I think, gave an indication of what what uh, most guard you think of the, the current culture. Just on a slightly more philosophical note, first of all, yeah, you say that you won't. I don't think that you don't think this will help um, minority relations, shall we say, and that that will mean all sorts of different things because all sorts of different minorities here. I think that's absolutely true because, as we have said ad nauseum. One of the fundamental things that will affect the way people perceive their relationships and their politics is the sense of whether or not the thing is being fair or non fair. So, first of all, I don't see why one emotion, and we are, this is what it is hate is an emotion, we are making a certain kind of emotion illegal, and therefore we're privileging. Why me having a prejudice against one of the nine classes and happening to mention this fact as I oh, I don't know, I hit granny over the head to steal her pension, is somehow worse than somebody who needs, uh, he wants to get a fix, and out of a desire to get a fix, hits granny and takes her pension. Or somebody who has seen a really, really nice Ugo Boss suit on sale in BTs and knocks over a series of grannies. Because, you know, an Ugo Boss suit, even on discount, is going to cost more than a pension. So you're going to have to knock over a series of grannies. So that's greed. One is greed, gluttony. Why does greed and gluttony get away with it, but hatred is? I, I don't understand. But if you start to prosecute people differently and with different intent and to a different degree punish them because you want to protect a certain group of class of people, I don't see how that isn't potentially going to raise an element of sense of unfairness and of resentment. And while I know the political response of, shall we say, most of the gay community, and the community obviously in inverted commas, I would say that if you were to ask any, 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 any gay man, 
Frank, any brown man, any whatever group you happen to come from, any woman, any, if they had been assaulted, what's your number one concern? I would say their number one concern is getting the guy who did it and not being distracted by issues around spending money on this kind of shit. One could perhaps make the point, Michael, that the closure rate of some of these crimes might be the part you should the guards should probably pay attention to and that bringing up that rate might actually do more to improve just community relations and relations more generally i always love when guards and sorry but police forces generally start talking about community policing and the need to engage with the community yeah because it's often done at the same time as actual closure rates on on crimes drop substantially and you do have to think you know the community would probably like you more if you could stop their houses being burgled that might actually be like a really good indicator to them that you are trustworthy more than what seems to happen a lot in community engagement, which is everyone feeling lovely about each other. Anyway, Gary, we're going to be feeling lovely uh, away next week because we're going to be working for the people. Yes, yes, we have been summoned away. We've been summoned away. Uh, so it is very possible that there will be no show next week. But let's face it, we won't say 100% no. Because with God, all things are possible. Or quantum exactly. physics. Or with quantum physics as well. I mean, you know, maybe there will be uh, a quantum moment and uh, a show will appear out of nowhere. But, I mean, that uh, sounds like nonsense, but sure enough. <laughs> it sounds like nonsense to me, but people who know about physics, well, they, they, they know more than me, uh, which is not difficult to tell me these things. This is part of quantum physics. I have no clue. That may be complete bullshit. But on, anyway, this is, it's a beautiful day. We have apparently another couple of days before the rain comes. So I recommend that people should go out and go and walk and maybe even go to the sea. But don't get in it because it's a little bit cold yet. And we will be back when we are back. All the best.